My guest today is a rather large life-size, larger than life-size legend of country music, Pee Wee King, who's uh, been good enough to spend this half hour talking about some of ex his experience in country music, some of the people he's known, and something about his uh, glorious career. It has been a, it's, it has been a good role for you, Pee Wee, it hasn't it? It certainly has, Milton. I wouldn't change a thing. All the uh, 40 some odd years I've been in show business, uh, the bottom line is I'm still here. I miss a lot of my friends who've passed away or gone on, but I'm still here to carry on. In 1974, uh, you know, you've had a lot of highlights in your career, but in 1974, I suppose you had an unsurpassed honor when Johnny Cash was the presenter when you were nominated and inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And for person in country music, that's the Academy it's, Award, isn't it? It certainly is. And that's a thrill you'll never forget no matter what happens to you before or after because your peers have voted for you and said that you are the one to be chosen. You know? Many are called, but few are That's chosen, it. I think, <laughs> is the way it goes. That's right. And Cash is a particular favorite of you. He's, he's an interesting man. Now. Yes, he uh, is. Cash. He's an interesting man. Now. Yes, uh, he is. Cash, who has known drugs and prisons and the dark side of life, and now is sort of a, a folk hero of, of, uh, of America, isn't he? He sure is, and not only that, he's an inspiration for a lot of newcomers. I think his uh, past experiences helped him. It's like Roy Acuff said many times, he said, I've done practically everything, and I could be a good preacher, but I chose uh, country music instead, and he, that's real. By Acuff, what did Acuff mean when he said he's done everything, everything bad? Well, well no, everything good and bad, right. but like Johnny, uh, he said many times, prison experiences helped him, the narcotics helped him, and uh, some of the things he did. You know, Pee Wee, if you examine the lyrics of country music and some of the legends of country music, you get all kinds of heartbreak. Uh, lovers betraying lovers, uh, families splitting apart, uh, almost a musical soap opera. That seems to be more a part of country music almost than anything, about gut reactions to life. Well, it touches, uh, reality touches everybody in some way or other. Tragedies years ago uh, were more exploited, and uh, that was the way to do it, by records and that. Today we have television and radio, and uh, of course it's new tragedies, love experiences, sex experiences. We couldn't write about uh, sex years ago, and when I was a member of the Grand Ole Opry, I remember the early days, we couldn't write a song about wine, whiskey, beer, sex. That was a no-no. So we had to write June, Moon, and Spoon. That's right. And when music became more expressive or more permissive, if you will, yes. in the form of rock, when they talked about things that you wouldn't even consider over the dinner table, and many radio stations refused to play them, they talked about many subjects which were beyond the pale. Country music never did approach that. They came a little bit into such modernistic things as uh, Feminism and, uh, That's right. and the liberated woman, uh, Loretta Lynn's right. uh, uh, pioneering efforts in that. But they never went whole hog in that kind no, of music. No, uh, it was always taboo with us, and we respected that no-no. But, uh, of course, today uh, I have said this at songwriters' uh, meetings before, how fortunate these boys are who are songwriters and girls who are songwriters. They have the tapes that they can put on what they want, and erase what they want and keep it for reference later on. And I always tell them, songwriters, don't throw anything away. You never know that voice basket may contain one line that you're hunting for all the time. The secret of a, of a, of a hit song, though, is uh, about as far from scientific perfection as you could find. There's no computer. There's nobody who sits on high and says, this will be a hit, this will be no, a flop, this will be nobody. a hit. Nobody. And nobody, no matter how smart they are, can, can forecast that. No, because if they could, he'd, that person would be a millionaire, I'll tell you. Many uh, times over. Oh, many times. It all begins with a song. That's the songwriter's creed. You stop to figure what a funny world we'd have without songs, without music. We were talking about uh, the tribulations of a man like Johnny Cash and other people who... Well, uh, Haggard. Haggard, you know, who, who fought and successfully, and not always successfully, the drug scene. Uh, tragic airplane crashes, uh, divorces, messy uh, third-party affairs and all that. The life of Pee Wee King, on the contrary, seems to have been one 
You're married to the same woman all this time. You're happily married. You have had uh, uh, a, a long measure of successes. I don't know of any bark, dark shadows in your life, Pee Wee. What's wrong with you? Uh, I don't know. I guess <laughs> that's the way I like it. I've been married to my wife for 43 years, formerly a girl singer with the Clayton Mac Mitchell's band, oh, yes. one of the Hoosier maids, and, and the daughter of my late father-in-law, Mr. Joe Frank. And he was quite a pattern for me to live like, and also Gene Autry. He was married to the same woman until she passed away. So I patterned myself after a couple of good guys. Pee Wee, did you have any bad chapters in your life? You know, I'm, I joke about it, but you know, everybody who knows you, knows you as a sunny disposition all your life, rarely saying anything bad about anyone, succeeding always. You really, uh, surely there must have been some times in your life when you despaired. Well, probably one time when my mother passed away, uh, a tragic uh, drowning at the river on a farm where I grew up in Abrams, Wisconsin. Uh, I took to drinking for a while. Did you? But I did it to myself. I did it all by myself. I was the kind of guy who could have about five or six drinks and go off in the corner and worry about things. And I finally got over that. We were talking about songwriting, too, and it comes, even to the best of songwriters, uh, as a great uh, honor to get one all-time oh, great hit. Now, here, yeah. look, you have on your, on your writing list the Tennessee Waltz, you have Slowpoke, Bonaparte's Retreat. These are almost classic American country music songs that have brought you Oh, some material wealth, I suppose, but enormous fame. It's an, it seems to me an unparalleled feeling you get when you know that the country is singing a song that you composed, you wrote. And also they're co-written with some wonderful people who I call Friends for Life. Chilton Price is a very dear lady here in Louisville, and I admire her, and we get together for good times, and Red Stewart and I, we've been together 41 years, and uh, those are the things I treasure most. And we enjoy the, if you could call, call it real success, together. That's what I like about it. Your life has been spent much of it in the media. You have done m thousands of radio and television shows. Oh, yes. I love it. Uh, that, that's, that's the bread and butter. Earlier, you asked me, what do I do for pastime on the long trips? Uh, most people read fiction books or uh, magazines. I, I read magazines but trade magazines and fan club journals <laughs> and local papers. When I get into a town, so I'm versed on what's going on in that territory. When we make an appearance, I probably use uh, some of the material I got out of the paper for discussions and talk, you know, and, and tell jokes on it about, on the stage. Are your friends mostly musicians, Pee Wee? Uh, no, I have some people who are not in the music business in any way, and they are dear friends. But I also love my mu musician friends, and we get together quite often. In fact, uh, three, four times a year. Who has shaped your life, your professional life, principally? Uh, I would say uh, Mr. Frank and Mr. Autry. Gene Autry? Yes. Uh, he, has, he has a way of things. He instills in you things that you remember the rest of your life. How did you get together with Gene Autry? Through Mr. J.L. Frank. He, uh, Frank was your father. Father-in-law. And, and what, an agent, agent, was he? He was Gene Autry's manager. Right. And... Uh, one day, Gene Autry was working in Chicago at the barn dance, and uh, he was driving through a scene in Wisconsin. I was going to high school in Milwaukee at that time, and I had a program on the air with a band I had called the King's Jesters. And they had a wreck with their Buick, and uh, the, some of the boys couldn't play their instruments, and they happened to have the radio on at the, uh, at the garage. He stopped in to be towed in, and we were playing some kind of a silly song, and he got a kick out of it, and he said, Mr. Frank, he says, call that radio station, see who those guys are. Now, was he a big star at that time? No, because my answer, he said, this is Mr. Frank, I am the manager of Gene Autry. I said, who is Gene Autry? Uh -huh. But see, we were working around Milwaukee and had no chance to hear too much of the barn dance. And you didn't know Frank either? No, oh no, I never, I thought he was a big bully guy, you know. Right. And later on when I got to meet him, he was a tall, slender man with a mustache and very congenial. And an and that's attractive that daughter, was. right? Yes. Well, he had two of them, but I got one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Did he become your manager then? Oh, uh, later on, yes. He was uh, my manager with the band, 
and later on he became my father-in-law. Well then, when you said who was Mr. Autry, what happened after that? Then he said, we have a date to do in Port Washington, Wisconsin, we need a band. He explained his situation and I says, well, we can go. I said, we got nothing to do this Sunday afternoon. He said, be there by three o'clock. And we saw Autry and his uh, manager and uh, we played pretty good shows, I guess, because he said, I like what you boys do. He said, would you like to go on tour with me? Well, some of the boys were uh, reluctant, and I grabbed on a brass ring, and I stayed on it. And you stayed with Autry? Yes. I came back. We, uh, we did the shows with him in Port Washington, and a couple months later, I joined him on the uh, tour, and we've been friends ever since. You still He's been my idol. Really? Yes. What kind of a man is Gene Autry? The most likable man that a person would want to know, and a very good-hearted person. He instilled in me a phrase that I always use, nothing is being done today that hasn't been done before. <laughs> and it's true when you look at life. Well, had he always been, Pee Wee, uh, such an outstanding businessman? He had so many organizations, so many corporations today. <laughs> you know, teams of all kinds. The uh, funniest, what I can uh, tell you is when we travel on some of those road shows, he carried a slot machine for the boys to entertain themselves backstage. Uh -huh. Because when you do a show, four or five shows a day in the theater, and you get away from the theater, you forget about time and don't give them, you miss a show somewhere along the line. And he thought if he had a slot machine, he'd have them boys sticking around backstage. And uh, we couldn't win jackpots too often, so he would pay us off by giving us a dinner somewhere. I see. That was his way of compensating it. And was he into business in those days, into acquiring no, companies? No, not, not yet. He had... Uh, he had a saddle, didn't have a horse, and we carried a carpenter's <laughs> horse and put the saddle on, and then he would sing, my saddle, my old pal and me, you know. And well, these are the things I remember. How? He does too. I, and he's still a friend, good friend of you to this day. Oh, every one of his early uh, cohorts, he remembers them. Jimmy Wakeley, Merle Travis, people like that. You know, Pat Buttram. The, uh, speaking about Buttram brings up something interesting. We you know the country music, and I'd like to get to that is so important and has gone through the whole cross-section of America, you know, with people who like classical, symphony, opera, pop. They like country music, all of them, it seems. But country humor is also a very interesting segment of country music. You mentioned Pat Buttram, one of the funny men. Was, was there always a, f a comic along with all the musical groups? Well, I can speak for myself uh, that I, and I, as you said, who, patter, who did I pattern my life after? Gene had two guys on his show called Ralph and Elmer. That was Frankie Marvin and Whitey Ford, the Duke of Paducah. Oh, yes. And he dressed up in a little funny green suit, and uh, Frankie dressed up in a little brown suit, and they got on stage. They were the comics of the show. And uh, I always thought comedy should be done by one man, stand up and tell jokes. Right. But that wasn't so. It was interwoven during the show. At any time, they'd bust down the stage and get a laugh. So, what uh, with physical business? Physical and uh, uh, expressions. Right. And uh, later on, when I went to the Grand Ole Opry, funny faces and funny noises to the work. That's, that's really? right. right. Uh, uh, well, the Hoosier Hot Shots, right. uh, for instance, they had that little horn on there, play their music and that horn would squeeze there at the right time and make a funny noise and people would laugh. But for me, I remember when I organized the first theater tour that we took out east to play some of the big theaters, Minnie Pearl was my comic. Right. She, she, she joined the Golden West Cowboys. I had a good singer. You couldn't find a better one, Eddie Arnold. I've heard of him. Right. <laughs> and later on replaced by Red Stewart and he's still with me. But uh, we, we copied it all. Then uh, later on, dancers. I figured dancers had to be an important part of the show. So when you, we molded it all together, put it in one package, we had comedy, ballads, funny uh, songs, and, uh, and a hit song. Did the comedy come at the same time the music, or was that added later? Added later. It was. Yeah. Just to round out the show. Right, because when I went to the Grand Ole Opry, they were strictly instrumentalists. The Grand Ole Opry is a, a unique institution. Now they're in the new building, of course, and things have changed a little bit. They're a little slicker, but they're still as popular with the public as ever. But the the original Grand Ole Opry in the old building and the backstage turmoil, I understand that it had a certain uh, 
disorganization that was charming. It, it, that it, I mean, there were people char churning around backstage. It wasn't a slick New York impromptu. production. Right? Everything was impromptu. What was it like there in the dressing rooms and in the wings and on well, the stage? That's where that's where everything happened. That's where the, all the action was because artists would get together, pat each other on the back, and tell lies and tell the truth and have fun, congeniality, friendship, love. Because there was no money in those days, Milton. We worked. What would you for get peanuts. for being on the uh, Grand Ole Opry? Uh, nothing. Oh. Just for appearing on the Grand Ole Opry. Not even peanuts. That's right. Uh, in those days, that was, well, I joined the Opry in 1937 and when it was at the Tabernacle, in the uh, uh, Fatherland Street Tabernacle. And I remember the first time we brought Bandy Buren and his square dancers from Kentucky to appear on the uh, Grand Ole Opry. The preacher raised Cain with us because he said there's no dancing on Saturday night in his tabernacle. And that was the fir first, first dancers time. that I remember. Now, on where did the people, uh, it was a radio broadcast. Yes. Now, did they just wait in the wings until they were introduced and come out? And the, did, did you all, did you have dressing rooms or did no, you No, those days we had, we were standing outside waiting to be called. And if you missed, if you didn't hear your name, you missed a spot on the show. <laughs> Right. Now, did they time it? And, and no, there was no time. They just went until the just time ran out. on and on and on until, and it's still that way to a degree. For uh, commercial reasons, I would say they time it. But uh, the people like encores. When you sing a song that they love, they call you back again. We call that an encore. Right. Well, encores were taboo with the Grand Ole Opry recently because they said we got to watch time, and the public objected so much that they finally consented to having them again. Did you, in the early days, were there people at the stage show, were there people, autograph hunters at that time? Yes, uh -huh. they, but they wouldn't bother us too much during the radio show because they didn't want to interrupt the radio show, so we stayed around after 12 o'clock and signed autographs. Now, the, the payoff was, Pee Wee, was not the money then, it was the fame you the got love. from the radio broadcast and, and the love, you yeah. say, but was translated so that when you did make tours, people knew you by virtue of the radio station and packed the places. A lot of things happened. Uh, the image you create on radio, uh, people thought I was six foot five and 250 pounds when they said Pee Wee. Just like they did Tiny Hill. He was a big, America's biggest band leader. But he was a big man. Yes, yes. But, and the image you create, uh, take, a, take someone like uh, Minnie Pearl. You can talk about her garb and her dress and her things that she does on stage for weeks, but now they see it on television. And when you, she tells jokes, they still want to hear the old joke about brother and nabob and... Uh, and, uh, and in real life, Minnie Pearl, I understand, is a handsome, a wealthy, cultivated, yes, middle-aged woman, right? And does a lot for charity. Right. She is a wonderful, yeah. She's a very classy person, but oh, plays yeah. the part of a female rube, I guess. That, that's it. The Grand Ole Opry, too, going back to what you were saying a little while ago, we had a chance by doing a radio show one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, when somebody from the audience came up to you, you tell them to go off backstage and you get to visit with them. They ask you, how's your kids? How's your wife? And they get to know you personally, and lo and behold, Christmas time, you get Christmas cards from them and you answer them. That's the, con that's the contact we still love. Pee Wee, do you think uh, there are more basic values in country people and country living than big city folks and big city living? Well, I don't know the big city living and uh, big folks in any business except country business. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to live in suburban areas. Uh, I, of course, I've only lived since I left home in two towns, Nashville and Louisville. So uh, when I had a chance to come back to Louisville, I grabbed at it leaving the Grand Ole Opry, and a lot of people said, oh, you're making a mistake. Because uh, if you go in there for television, it's just a fad, it won't last. Yeah. Well, <laughs> here I am, you know. But I love uh, Louisville. It's not my home, but uh, I'm proud to be in Kentucky. And if I ever have to do it over again, this is gonna be my home. <laughs> Are you friends with people such as uh, Loretta Lynn and did you know Elvis Presley, for instance? I knew Elvis uh, by working a few shows with Elvis. And uh, backstage was not a real place to know Elvis as he was. But his manager was my road manager. When he first started in the country music business, 
and Tom Parker told me he was a great kid. And Tom never had any children of his own, and he took uh, Elvis under his wing as he would his own You're son. You're talking about Colonel Parker. Colonel right? Tom Parker. Colonel Parker's being sued now by uh, some members of the Presley family. That will probably go on. Anytime money enters the picture, there's going to be lawsuits. You know that. Presley, did you get to know him at all? Uh, very little. Just, as I say, by our appearances together on stage shows. Well, was, was uh, Parker a backstage manipulator, or was he a shrewd manager, or, or was he some kind of secret kind of uh, agent? How would you describe Colonel Tom Parker, who see, about whom there seems to be not too much known? When Tom Parker was Eddie Arnold's manager, he learned everything he knows about managing a superstar. So consequently, when he and Eddie broke up, he had to have a superstar, and he glommed on to a boy that he knew could be made into a superstar, and he did it. I have to say that's the greatest marriage in show business. I have never seen anything that'll compare with it, because Tom Parker understood Elvis, Elvis understood Tom Parker, and respected each other. And I think that combination is pretty hard to beat. About Loretta Lynn, you asked me, do I know her well? I remember when I was uh, sick in the hospital, I got a telegram from, from Loretta. I got a letter from her. And she says, better get well because the business is not the same without you. And then when I went into the Hall of Fame, I received that telegram I was referring to. It says, who said that good guys don't make it? <laughs> I treasure that. That, right. that is such a great expression. Nice person. Oh, yeah. What effect did the outlaws, the so-called rebels, have on the Nashville scene? Peter? Oh, you mean the rednecks? Well, that's uh, what they call them. Do they call them? All right. Yeah. The, the, the outlaws of music, uh, Waylon Jennings and uh, Willie Nelsons and so forth. Well, I can explain it easier by giving you my experiences. Early, my early days on the Grand Ole Opry were rather hectic because the solemn old judge didn't understand Western music or what we were trying to play. Um, the musicians at the Grand Ole Opry, like uh, when I went, first came there, the Possum Hunters. Who do you mean the solemn old judge? He was the creator of the Grand Ole Opry, George D. Hay. Right. And he thought it all began and ended with a fiddle, banjo, and a guitar. Right. And he, they weren't supposed to be musicians. In fact, when we went to Nashville, our union cards weren't respected. We belonged to the Musicians' Union, and the, the union says, well, you don't have to be a union musician to be on the Grand Ole Opry. See, those fellas came from their farms right to the stage of the Grand Ole Opry, played what they felt, and it was good. That's what they called hillbilly music when it first started. That's the offshoot of country music, I mean, the beginning of country music. But then we started playing Western music, and there was a difference. But you weren't a rebel in that sense. You no, gave but a that's new what dimension. it came to it later. Some of the boys wanted to play what they felt was uh, Texas music, Texas swing or a different presentation. And they started what they called uh, 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 redneck music. I guess West, Western Swing was the offshoot of what we started out, uh, not to knock any uh, country music or anything, but I, now I couldn't play Bill Monroe's music. I couldn't do Roy Acuff's music. So I did what I thought was right. Willie Nelson does what I he thinks take it, you, right. uh, Not to put words in your mouth, but you think any of that makes a contribution, even if it's different. That's right. Ethnic music of any kind, like I, I enjoy polkas because they're happy. Then you turn around and you sing a ballad of tragedy, a real, real hillbilly tearjerker, and then you come back with a gospel song. So it all adds up to entertainment. That's the only thing. Yeah. Nelson has a big song on the road, which is autobiographical. On the other hand, it's a song that easily you could have done because you have spent so many years on the road. Did you enjoy that experience, family man that you are? We, we didn't know any better. Let's say it was part of life. Just like a man going to his office every morning, driving through that traffic. Now, since I've uh, slowed down a little bit, I watch these people and I say, my God, how could we do that when there were two lane highways, be in Radford, Virginia one night and jump across to St. Louis, Missouri the next night? And, I, and these people are doing the same thing that we did to keep music alive. And to me, uh, it was just a love for it. First of all, it was survival. That was the only way we could survive at that time. 
and I guess the same with an office man or a worker who goes to the Ford plant. You travel what? Four decades? Oh yes, forty some years. Always. Uh, Army yes. camps. Yes, we small were the first. We were the first Army camp show that went on the road with the Camel Caravan. I'll never forget that. Nineteen months in every part of the United States and foreign countries. What has that done for your children in the way of influencing them for or against going into the business? It was uh, some uh, effect on their lives because none of them are in show business. Yeah. But they appreciate the show people. Uh, I love them for what they do. And my wife was a, a great uh, inspiration for them. She wanted them to have a normal family life without uh, the suffering that she had to do by raising the family by herself. Uh, and they're very successful. I have a, girl, a daughter and three sons, twin boys. They love what they're doing. Pee Wee How, I don't want to be morbid about this, but the time will come eventually. How would you like Pee Wee King to be remembered? Let's say like Loretta put in her telegram, just a good guy. That, I think that's the best explanation you could give uh, any man and say he, he was a good guy. Then you, you don't have to ask questions. Well, I don't think we're ready to put a put an epitaph <laughs> on you yet, but I want to be ready. Uh, uh, I, I think it's a nice. I think it is. You know that that good guys do finish first. I I have never seen you really upset or angry, Pee-wee, and yet I know you must. You're human. What does get you perturbed? What do you get upset about? Uh, when I try to make a point that I think is uh, the truth. And rightfully so. Uh, recently, we were in a subcommittee meeting in Washington for the uh, songwriters, BMI, Broadcast Music Incorporated, and they're trying to pass a law that, uh, or, or tear down a law that is passed for performances. Right. Well, when a songwriter uh, writes a song and it becomes a hit, you'd hate to go someplace and hear it played and don't get right. uh, money for that. Because if you do a job, that's our tools. And that got you upset. And that, that, something like that gets me upset. Pee Wee, it's been a lovely autumn day here in Louisville, and I thank you for being our guest on Bywords. Oh, man. You mean the time's going by that fast? Our guest has been a member of the Country Music Hall of Fame, my good friend, and everybody's favorite guy, Pee Wee King. This is Milton Metz at WHS for Bywords. Thank you very much.